Hi everyone, it's Alex here at Cestrian Capital Research. It's five o'clock Eastern on Thursday, the 11th of August. Welcome everyone to our weekly webinar. Today we have some guests uh, with us. Uh, some of our new newsletter subscribers uh, are with us. Um, you'll recall that we open these sessions every now and then about once a month to newsletter members who don't typically get access to the webinars, um, but as a taste of the full service, we occasionally open the door to them. So if you're a newsletter subscriber, thanks very much for signing up to the new service. I really appreciate your business and your time and welcome to our webinars. We do these uh, twice a week uh, in the main service. And if you find that you enjoy the webinar or find it useful, then uh, do consider upgrading to the full service. Um, most people have been happy they've done so. Okay, now without further ado, uh, our topics today, we have a lot of them. We're going, to, we're going to go through the disclaimer in a moment. We're going to talk about the market using the queues and SPY. We're going to look at the, some of the reasons the market's up so much, and we're going to think about when it might uh, fall back again and why. We're going to look at some leading indicators of risk, being crypto and some of the other high beta stuff. I want to talk about four slow money opportunities, being Airbnb, Datadog, Sentinel One, and Spire. A couple of fast money ideas, um, Soxel uh, and the Triple Q levered uh, index ETFs. I'm going to talk about sector rotation, and as always, we'll do open mic Q&A uh, at the end, but also usual rules apply. So if you have a question or a point to raise, any point in the webinar, just shout. Um, everyone uh, here is unmuted from my end. So if you have a point you want to make, then just unmute at your end and speak up. Uh, if you're a uh, Fat Growth Investor Pro member and you can't make yourself heard, then just type out the question in the chat room, in, in the main chat room of the main service, and I can see it there. The, the questions function in this webinar system doesn't work so well, so either speak up or type it in the main chat room. Okay, without further ado, uh, let's go to the disclaimer. Uh, so disclaimer, this webinar is intended for US recipients only, and in particular is not directed at nor intended to be relied upon by any UK recipients. Any information or analysis in this webinar is not an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any securities. Nothing in this webinar is intended to be investment advice, nor should it be relied upon to make investment decisions. Session Capital Research, its employees, agents or affiliates, including the author of this webinar or related persons, may have a position in any stocks, securities or financial instruments referenced in this webinar. Any opinions, analyses or probabilities expressed in this webinar are those of the author as of the webinar's date of transmission and are subject to change without notice. Companies referenced in this webinar, their employees or affiliates may be customers of Sestrian Capital Research. Sestrian Capital Research values both its independence and transparency and does not believe that this presents a material potential conflict of interest or impacts the content of its research or publications. Okay, so briefly topics. Um, so let's go first of all to the market overview. Let's start with the S and P. So long time members here will know that we've been using this uh, five wave up pattern to trace the market's progress. And uh, since the November highs, we've been tracking it down, but let's just go back to the start of the sequence to remind us of why this is useful. So this is, this is you know, a real life what happened to the S&P, but as it happens, it's a pretty textbook example of Elliott waves and Fibonacci's in progress. And the extension degrees and the retracement degrees are pretty textbook. And so the reason we use this is that because the one up and the two down and the three up were a textbook, it's quite likely that the four down and eventually the five up are also textbook. It's not a guarantee, but it's quite likely. So just to refresh our memories, from the 2016 lows, the S&P put in a wave one up, peaking just below, just before the COVID crisis, it put in a wave two, deep, fast wave two in the COVID crisis, bottoming out at the 78.6% retracement of that wave one up. Put in a classic wave three up that peaked at almost the dollar, the 1.618 extension of wave one. And then we've been in a wave four down, um, which thus far troughed at the somewhere between the 382 and the 0.5 Fibonacci level retracement uh, of that wave three up. And you know, on the way down, we looked at possible retracement points, sorry, reversal points. The 236 was a possible reversal point. Um, in retrospect, a bit ambitious that. 382 
was high probability reversal point that crashed through that as it happens, but not too too much further. It didn't spend very long below that level, below 380. And then 380 was a battleground for a while. This is in the SPY. In, in the SPX, it corresponds to about 3800 in the futures, again, about 3800. Um, and in the recent rally off of the June lows, you can see what's happened, right? So let's just zoom in a bit. You can see how these Fibonacci levels are respected. So 382 turns into support, it's pushed up, and it's hit an indecision point around this 236 retrace. So that 418, 419 level is pretty key. It hit it two days ago, bounced back. Yesterday pushed up through, today went all the way up and all the way back down again. And right now it's sat at yeah, 420 in the SPY, so just above this. So this is a key level for the S&P. If the S&P can do one of two things, then we're likely off to the races in a new wave five up. Either, most bullishly, if it can turn that 418, 419 into support and keep moving up, that's very bullish. And that suggests that we're on the way to a new high. Um, more vomit inducing on the way, but still a viable bull path would be if the S&P fell back to that 380 level, but this time found support at that level and then moved on up. Now, if it did that, that again will be absolutely compliant with common Fibonacci patterns. So if we took, if we just measure the distance in this wave four low so far to the high so far and the move up. Um, if it did fall back to this 382 level, then that would be a, a roughly a wave one up, a wave two down, bottoming up between the 618 and the 786 retracement of that move up off the June lows, which as you know, is pretty standard wave two retrace. So two bullish things can happen here. Either that 419 is turned into support and off we go, could, could happen, just for sure. Um, or probably more likely, in my view, we have a little sell-off uh, and find support around that 380, at which point we make it, we, we set off again on that wave way five up. Both those are completely compatible with the idea of a new high in the next year or so. It's possible, of course, we could still be in a bear market down. And that argument until, you know, last week, the week before, was still quite compelling because you can see, you don't need to draw it, you can see a down channel here. Um, and we were looking to see whether that upper bound would be broken. Because if the upper bound was broken, then that was some evidence to say that, well, maybe we're not just in a down market now. So when that band there roughly was broken, as a bullish move. And you can see again, if in fact, the S&P sells off and finds support around that 380, then very roughly, very roughly, the top of that resistance line on the way down may turn into support. So there's two reasons why, you know, we may come back down here before I move up. So right now, uh, house view is, you know, we should be neutral, we shouldn't, be bullish or bearish, which is just react, but house view is probably more bullish than bearish, reason in the midterms. You know, it's not a surprise or uh, to us at least, and I don't believe it's a coincidence that inflation suddenly rolled over, CPI rolled over, PMI rolled over, um, and you know, the market's off to the races. If we just look very briefly at the CPI print this week, the thing that everyone got excited about, this is the US Department of Labor, by the way, it's the official print, the thing everyone got excited about was this July zero here, this fat zero here. So what this says is, well, across the whole basket, all items, prices didn't increase in July versus June. Now, prices were still up 8.5% versus July last year, um, but apparently we, we, we're no longer concerned about that. It's just because it stopped going up monthly, the market concluded that therefore the Fed will soften uh, and therefore stocks should move up. And we'll see whether that happens. We'll see whether the Fed softens and we'll see what happens with stocks. But that, that I believe, is the, the catalyst. Let's look at the NASDAQ. Um, we'll use the QQQ ETF. Um, and whether you use the NASDAQ index or the NQ futures, it's the, it's the same chart, basically. So let's zoom out again from the 2018 lows to Q4 2018. 
Notice that put in a wave one up and a wave two down, troughing at the COVID crisis. Again, a 78.6% retrace. The wave three up was an absolutely to the dollar 2.618 extension of the wave one. Spooky how that happens. And then we've been in this uh, you know, zone of misery here. So we put in a, an A wave down, a B wave up, and a C wave down. And then since then, pretty much, the index has moved up. And we've been very, very, very focused, I'll just move out of the way, on this level right here. Because again, as we were just talking about with the S&P, what we said is, well, if, if the index can break out of this down channel and start to turn this into support, then there's a good argument we're off to the races for a new high. If it can't break out, then we're probably going to keep going down. And um, you know, we could get, we could drop as low as 258 on the queues, and that still wouldn't invalidate the notion that we're going to find a new high. But it will be from here that would be a be a brutal drop, and it could happen. So we have to see. Um, same logic as the S and P. A bullish move would be to turn that 316, 317 level into support and move up. But if it fell down a bit further and turn the next fib level down, that 288 level into support and move up again, that's perfectly consistent with a new high. So the, the, the sort of factor behind our house view, which leans somewhat bullish, I won't say, you know, snorting, roaring ball, but somewhat bullish is you have the midterms coming up. 401ks have been, you know, hurt, badly hurt, and that's not a good look. So you have um, poor people paying more for gas and food than they can afford, and you have rich people with their 401ks in pain. So that's not a great uh, way to enter an important election. So howsoever it manifests itself, I would expect to see governmental action, quiet, loud, various branches of government, um, to just ease the market back up again. I don't mean set it on fire, but just help it on the way up. Okay. Um, Let's look briefly at um, a couple of leading risk indicators. But before we do, does anyone have any questions about the S&P, about the NASDAQ, about anything we talked about in Market Matters just now? Again, if you do, just unmute yourself your end and speak up. Okay. I see nobody with any questions. Okay, let's move on. So uh, one of the other things we've been doing in these webinars is using a couple of early indicators as sort of risk sentiments, canaries in the coal mine, if you will. And um, we've used uh, crypto, we've used the ARK funds, and we've used the 10-year the yield. Let's briefly look at the 10-year yield. So this is the yield on the 10-year US Treasury bond. Just ignore that for a second. So the real pain point in the market was when, there you go, that's just mid-June, that's just as we enter the June lows, was when the 10-year hit that 3.5% level, which was you know, above the last time Fed tightening was on the, the card. So Q418, Fed tried to tighten and was, let's call it, persuaded not to by the incumbent administration at the time. Um, moved back to loosening, and you saw you know, the 10-year plummets here, and equities basically did the reverse. Equity shot up. Um, so the fact that the 10-year yield around here, in the middle of May, was challenging that high was was relevant. And in June, which was a real low uh, in equities, it pushed up to this three and a half level, and it's just come down, you know, pretty sharply ever since. So what happens to this 10-year tells us something about the direction of equities. So that's one canary. The next canary, let's use crypto. Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is you know, an extreme form of risk asset. There's no reality to it. It trades purely according to sentiment. And you know, its moves, as you can see here, are, are brutal and extreme. So um, it does, however, follow Fibonacci levels pretty well and you would expect that it's a it's a it's a notional asset it, it trades on nothing other than sentiment there's no reality to trade there's no earnings no dividends there's no fundamental valuation it can only trade on sentiment and let's look at what it did so from the 2018 lows wave one up wave two down peaking actually just a little bit low this below the 78.6 retrace 
COVID low, rockets up, puts in almost the dollar of 5.618 extension of the prior wave one, uh, and then a wave four down and a wave five up, peaking just above that prior wave three highs. That's a really nice five wave up move, forming a larger degree wave one. That's this purple line here. It then puts in a deep wave two correction, and it, and it is a deep correction. And if we look at the retracement of the whole level of the whole move, it retraces, yeah, almost to the dollar to the 786 retrace of that wave one up. That usually is a pretty good guide to that being a hard stop, that being a, a, a hard reversal at that point. You see it time and again. The only argument against that in Bitcoin is very often when we get these corrections, you get these ABC moves where you get the A down, the B up and the C down. And very often a correction isn't done until you've had a C leg equivalent in drop in price per share to the A leg down. We haven't had that in Bitcoin. Now, if that were to happen, we could see Bitcoin down to the 11 and a half thousand to get. That's a big drop from now. So query whether that's likely, it may happen. Um, I, I, in chart school, you would say, again, that June low, that's a low because it's just a textbook wave two drop. It's you know, brutal, painful, liquidations all the way down, margin calls all the way down, everyone's screaming about the end of Bitcoin. That's what you expect to see in a wave two. Um, that's a large degree wave two. 786 retraced to the wave one up. That's a classic reversal point for wave two. So there's a good chance Bitcoin bottom there. Now you can find every bearish argument in the world as to why that's not true. Uh, and you know, five minutes on FinTwit and you know, you'll be running for cover. Um, and, and they may be right, you know, no one knows. But technically, that's a pretty good bottoming place. The Bitcoin has ripped up uh, since the June lows, and it's it, it's led the charge versus equity. So if you look, it's um, it bottomed out at they yeah, call it seventeen and a half thousand. It's now nearly at twenty five thousand. So it's it's put on um, you know, almost almost fifty percent up in what six weeks or something, um, seven weeks. That's pretty dramatic. And the reason to buy, I think, at the wave two lows is when it's, it looks scary, you know, everyone wants to vomit, nobody wants to consider the asset. These are good times to buy. If you're brave, if you're happy to use a stop loss, um, if you use risk management techniques, position size, all those things to keep yourself safe, they can be great places to buy. And anybody that was buying Bitcoin down here has done very well so far. Uh, Ether, same story. Ether, in my view, is a more compelling bottom because it's basically the same chart, right? One, two, big three, big four, big five up, peak just above that wave three high. Um, you've got the same deep wave two correction, the bottoms out at the same 786 retrace, but look, you've got a perfect A, B, C correction. So the A equals C condition that you often see is satisfied here. That um, C leg down was about equal to that A leg down and it, co it coincided with a 786 retrace reversal. ETH has rocketed up since that point. So, you know, it found a bottom that's in the 900s and then we know eight, wow, eight, eight 80s. And, you know, it's been troubling 1900 of late. So, you know, it's more than doubled since the June lows, pretty incredible. And you can see where it is now. And, it, you know, it, crypto does respect these FIB levels. It, it, it almost has to, because these things are purely measuring sentiment and what is crypto if not pure sentiment. Uh, so we're back now at 61.8 retrace of that big wave one up and yeah, we'll encounter some resistance there. Even if it pushes through, ultimately we'll encounter some resistance there. You saw what happened last time it was here. It, it toyed with, with reversing here in the end, just plummeted to the 78, 78, 6. So we'll see some resistance here. A bullish sign is if Ether, you know, falls back a bit, but then keeps moving up and, and powers up um, from that 61.8 retrace uh, up to the 0.5 retrace at 2,400. And even then, of course, that would have been a big sell-off. So, you know, I, I who knows with crypto, but that, that's a bullish chart. If you didn't know that it was called Ethereum, if you didn't know anything about crypto, if you just looked at the chart, you'd say that's a bullish chart. You'd say, you know, volatile asset, use a stop loss, but we don't put all your money into it, but we don't buy it on a ton of leverage, um, but that's a bullish chart. Um, let's look finally for canaries at the ARC flagship fund. So 
let's get rid of this for a second. So this, you remember, is the um, Cathie Wood uh, Internet Innovation Fund. Much beloved in the post-COVID period. Now everyone hates it. Um, best fund manager ever here, worst fund manager ever here, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just a fund full of high beta names. There's nothing you know, particularly different or scary about it. Um, let's look at how it's traded. So let's look at the move up from the 2016 lows. So it's deep correction. So you can call that a large degree of wave one, wave two, and it's dropped you know, below the 78.6. So the question is, can this keep moving up? Again, it's moved up from 35 at the lows to 54 at the highs. So what's that? That's about a two thirds um, move up since then. So call it you know, a 60% move up off the lows. It's pretty remarkable. If art can keep moving up, Again, that's bullish for our indices. Now, what we found in our work here on the webinars is that ARC was moving up before the indices. Now, it bottomed a couple of days before the indices, and even before, actually, no, I'm sorry, that's not correct. It bottomed, look, it bottomed a couple of weeks, I thought so, a couple of weeks before the indices. Look, it bottomed there. So it bottomed in May, I thought so. And we watched this move up ahead of the indices. So that again tells you that it's a leading indicator of risk. It came down first before the indices did and it's moved up before the indices did. So this is a way to look a little bit into the future as to what the markets are going to do. So if, if you can use the 10-year, if you can use ARC, if you can use um, crypto just as a leading indicator of where in markets are headed, that's been working for us so far. So the interesting thing is that markets started to sell off a little bit today. Um, Crypto is still pumping, so make that what you will. Um, but so far, you know, crypto has led the market up just as it let it down. Crypto still on fire. So I don't think that you can conclude at this stage that we're into you know a new bear leg down. I mean, look at look at Ethereum now. Look at Ethereum now. Okay. Any questions on the high beta stuff? So we have a question in the chat room. Um, uh, how truly necessary, sufficient are A equals C corrections to satisfy a true low? Um, they're, they're not necessary. It's just evidence. I mean, of course, we don't you don't know when a low is in until after it's happened. But what you're looking for the whole time is uh, layers of evidence to tell you or to suggest that a bottom might be in. And so what, why I believe Ethereum is a more bullish chart than Bitcoin is, is very simple, which is, and, and you know, that this is crypto, doesn't matter. You could, you, it doesn't matter whether this is, you know, the world's most boring um, industrial business or the world's most scary altcoin, doesn't matter. The chart measures sentiment, that's all that matters. So Bitcoin, uh, you've got one piece of evidence that low is in, which is a 786 uh, retrace and reversal. That's pretty good evidence that a bottom is in, but you don't have the additional A equals C comfort. So you've always got that nag that says I might have another leg down yet. You can come up with all the reasons why it won't go down again, but the fact is you've got a nag in the back of your mind that says it might drop and drop hard again. Ether, you've got two pieces of evidence. All right, so you have the big old moves up, five ways up as before. You've got a reversal at or around 78.6 retrace. So that's one piece of evidence. Um, you also have this A equals C condition satisfied. So that's two pieces of evidence compared to Bitcoin's one. So th this is just, you know, how many um, how many arguments could you marshal in favor of it being a bottom? And here with Ether, there's I think two arguments and with Bitcoin there's one. So, and again, this ignores all reality, but then there isn't any reality with crypto, it's just sentiment. Okay, any other questions on um, leading indicators of risk, canaries in a coal mine, if you will? Remember, if you've got a question, just unmute yourself, your side, and chat. And for those of you who are full members of Growth Investor Pro, if you can't make yourself heard, just type into the chat room. Okay, no further questions, let's move on. Okay, we want to talk about some slow money ideas. So when we were gathering ideas of topics today, um, it turned out that people are interested in two kinds of ideas. One, how to make money quickly, and two, how to make money slowly. So that can't be a surprise. Slowly um, you know, with lower risk, and quickly with higher risk. So let's look at some of the slow money ideas we have on. And so if we look briefly at 
the Sestrian Stock Central resource. This is the main service. Then, you know, here we have our various uh, covered stocks, ratings, recent charts, and so on, earnings reports. Um, you will be aware that we use this accumulate whole distribute uh, mechanism. And the idea here is that we're trying to replicate the wick off cycle. Wick off cycle being make like big money, buy slowly when the stock's in the doldrums, build up a position quietly when no one's looking. Um, when it starts to move up quickly, just sit there, just hold tight, or somebody else marks up your holding for you. When it reaches a, a, pl a higher plateau, start to sell to distribute. And then when it falls off a cliff in the markdown phase, Hopefully, you're already long gone. Rinse and repeat. That's how big money makes money. That's how we can all make money if we know what to do. And sector rotation, which we'll talk about later, plays directly into that. None of this is affected by company earnings, what the company does. You can do this purely on the chart. So it works for indices, it works for ETFs, it works for single stocks, works for crypto, works for all these things, if you do it right. So our slow burn ideas are these accumulate hold, distribute, markdown ideas. And I'd like to talk about three today. Start with Airbnb. Um, let's talk briefly about the fundamentals of Airbnb. Airbnb is an incredibly good business. Um, my career has been spent in fundamental analysis primarily um, and investing in technology companies on a fundamental basis through venture capital, leverage buyouts and um, public stocks. This is an incredible business. This is a company which is growing revenues um, at 67% on a trading 12 month basis off of a revenue base now of $7.4 billion. So you have a revenue base of $7.4 billion um, that is growing on a historic 67% basis and this quarter grew at 58% year on year. That's pretty remarkable, it doesn't happen very often. It runs at a gross margin, that's um, profit after variable costs, at 82% on a trading 12 month basis. So you have huge growth, huge um, margins after variable costs. It's running at an accounting margin, EBITDA margin of 31% on a TTM basis. Now here we've backed out stock-based comp. And we can talk about that later. I've put posts in the newsletter service uh, about that this week. And on a cash flow basis, because Airbnb gets paid up front, it's at nearly 50% cash flow. Before, it, um, before after it pays for capex, after it's uh, gone through working capital changes, in other words, did you get paid first or did you pay out first, and before you paid any tax, it's so you have you have a seven billion dollar revenue line, growing revenue at fifty eight percent in the most recent quarter, making half of that in cash flow margins. That's an unbelievably good business. The business has net cash of nearly $8 billion after deducting debt. Um, and the valuation is, it's up a bit from that, I think it's one, one, eight or something to pay. You've been asked to pay nine times revenue, which, you know, and you have been asked to pay 19 times cash flow. Well, I can tell you that, you know, L3 Harris, the defense contractor, sells more than 19 times cash flow. And that is not growing 67%, and it certainly doesn't have 50% cash flow margins. So this is a fantastic business. Um, again, it doesn't matter what it does, just look at the numbers. And the valuation, the fundamental valuation, you know, everyone's grandpa would be perfectly happy with that when you compare it to anything else you can buy in the market right now. You, you look at the growth rate and you look at um, what size the company's likely to be in two years' time compared to, you know, some of these value stocks that are trading at bigger cash flow multiples, pay a small dividend, but they're not growing in this rate. They don't have these margins. So fundamentals are fantastic. Let's look at the stock chart. The stock has been beaten up really badly. What we do here is we use a slightly unconventional method to chart the waves, but it seems to work quite well. So for these recent IPO stocks, where there's no sort of low to trade against, if you like, we start the wave sequence at zero. Now you can throw rocks at this for sure. It's not theoretically uh, clean or anything like that, but it does seem to work quite well. So the, this sort of artificial wave one up, zero to 220 is the post IPO peak, and then a, a wave two down that so far troughed. Look, you can see 
almost exactly the 61.8 percent retrace which is you know it's very strange that these things happen so it, therefore it can't be strange it must be programmatic um, and then a, a move up and so there's a good chance we're in a new wave three up and, and as you know investing down here it's a great place to invest if you you know have some confidence and courage and probably more importantly if you protect yourself with risk management strategies like stop losses position size and so on so how we've been dealing with these accumulation ideas is we've been usually picking a couple of different Fibonacci levels and saying well look it's a reasonable place to to accumulate between these two levels this is the sort of thing that big money will do they won't try and buy it all below because yeah you can't no one's that good um they won't try and um only ever buy on crashes they'll just pick a zone in which case in which which area it's okay to buy big money will also control this somewhat by starting to sell once it reaches the top of the zone and then buy again at the bottom just to mute the price changes and you know be able to do this quietly um some people on uh, our platform manage enough money to do that others don't um if you don't it's easy because when you buy stock it doesn't move the market so you have the opportunity to accumulate in a way that big money doesn't because people don't notice when um, normal size accounts are buying. We think that Airbnb is a, is a good idea to accumulate between this 61.8 and the 382 retrace. So that's between about 136 and about 83. There's nothing you know, divinely inspired about those numbers, but um, just FIB levels are a good set of guardrails to use. And the idea with this accumulation is once it gets above that level, stop right just do nothing because look again this is a business growing revenue at 67 percent a year so if the market doesn't move if if stocks valuations don't go up or down from here um if valuation multiples stay the same and airbnb grows your know, revenue at 67 percent or even 50 percent the stock's probably going to go up by 50 to 67 percent if the market doesn't change in valuations there's nothing definite about that but you know as a rule of thumb it's not a bad way to sort of back sell for these purely technical arguments so on airbnb our view is you know try and accumulate in a zone and then sit tight and let other people mark the stock up for you once um, it starts to move up, up here other people will include momentum hedge funds who are skilled know what they're doing they'll buy here they'll sell up here they'll wait for it to drop buy down here sell up here they're good it's a perfectly good strategy that and other people are also um you know the mythical chad which is to say uh, you know, overly bullish uh, retail who, you know, at the moment are incredibly bearish because obviously stocks only ever go down now, but at some point stocks will only ever go up once again and they'll start buying again. And when that happens, you know, I think you can expect Airbnb to move up pretty quickly. Well, if you stop buying down here and you aim just to ride up this markup cycle and then distribute as we approach the top of a wave three, and as we get there, it, it, you, you can see this when it happens. You can tell by the FIB levels it reaches, you can see about the volumes traded, you can see about you know buyer exhaustion happening. You can see this. You know, in the service, we called the top of the market really well last November because it got to a key FIB level. Both the QQQ and the SPY kept bumping their heads on the, the ceilings here. And that said it was probably going to come down, which it did. So you can see when these tops happen. You know, you, you can judge when to sell. Anyone can do it. And so riding this. Uh, kind of stock up for the markup cycle and distributing it up, up here is a good play we think now to sell you have to con not fall in love with the stock because up here everyone will think airbnb is the best business ever and it's going to go up forever and blah 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 well it isn't and it won't it will sell off all businesses do all stocks do so that, so the discipline here is you know be prepared to get stopped out because something bad will have happened in the market um, or to the company if it starts going down below this level because think our sentiment was incredibly bearish in June. So if the stock gets below that level, you know, something wrong is happening in the world. Um, but have the discipline to stop buying after a level as well and have the discipline just to sit and do nothing and let other people write that unrealized profit into your account and then distribute up here. So that's Airbnb. Um, next one, uh, Datadog. Now Datadog, let's do the chart first and we'll come to the fundamentals after that. Datadog is just outside our accumulation zone, just outside it. Any weakness in the market in the coming days or the stock itself, it'll fall back in. And um, th this is a 
again, we'll see an incredibly good business. And so I don't think that it's unreasonable to be buying at these upper levels if you have a long term time frame in mind. You know, if you if you trying to play for days and weeks, well anything can happen. You know, if you buy here, it could be down at the sixty five dollar mark, you know, three weeks later. Who knows? But long term, I think this is a good bet. Um, so the same argument goes here. Be prepared to be disciplined to get stopped out. That stops quite a way away now, unfortunately. Um, you could put a tighter stop just below those June lows. That's reasonable. Um, and have a discipline only to buy within the, the zone. Nothing magical about the zone. It's defined by these FIB levels. If we look at the fundamentals of Datadog, Again, this is a fantastic business with one rider, which we'll talk about in a moment. So growth, again, it's huge. You have, a, it's a smaller business than Airbnb, it's just shy of 14, uh, so $1.4 billion of revenue in the last 12 months. It's growing that revenue base at 74% in the most recent quarter. And um, again, high margin, so 80% uh, gross margin this quarter, 79 on a TTM basis. Again, cash flow really strong. You know, everyone in the bar uh, will tell you, and everyone in the gym will tell you that high beta stocks don't make any money, right? Wrong, just kind of find ones that do. This is a 21% unlevered pre-tax uh, free cash flow margin business on a 12, trading 12 month basis. Now it gets there by paying its senior staff a heck of a lot of stock rather than cash, but who cares, right? It doesn't matter. That's what the market expects of these names and that's how it's able to generate so much cash. As a result, balance sheet is safe as houses. You have nearly a billion dollars uh, of liquid net cash after debt. Um, superb growth performance here from this business. Now, the fly in the ointment cloud on the horizon is the order book growth is slowing somewhat. You know, through 21, this RPO, remaining performance obligation, that's the order book, total value of the order book, uh, was showing huge growth. One, it's a big order book. You know, it's it's the size of you know, 75, 80% at this point in 21 of the whole 12 month, prior 12 months revenue. And it was growing, doubling, right? More than doubling in September uh, last year. But what's not to like? So you can work out from that that it's pretty obvious that revenue growth is going to accelerate. And um, it did, you know, and that wasn't unforeseeable. We said it loud in the service, in the full service. RPO big as a function of TTM revenue, growth faster than TTM revenue, revenue is going to accelerate. And look, it did two, three quarters later. Now, that's happening in reverse right now. And this is a concern. Okay, so you have a slowdown here. 85% um, down from 88, who cares, right? But 51% down from 85, that's, that's a concern. So what we want to see from Datadog is a turnaround in the rate of growth in the order book. So if next quarter we get a you know, 40% or 35% there, that's a concern because the thing is valued at you know, a big multiple of revenues, 25, probably a bit more than that times revenue now. And you can get away with that at huge, rev huge uh, rates of revenue growth and strong margins and strong forward order book growth. But you can't get away with that if um, growth is uh, likely to slow on the horizon. So you do have to watch this. And we won't get an update on that until next quarter, um, but the company will be all over this. The company will be concerned about that. You know, it, this number, will be absolutely um, at the forefront of the CEO's and the CFO's desk. And even more than that, the head of sales will be laser focused on these numbers because that's where they're comped. So, you know, they know what to do. They know how to fix that. They know they have to fix it, but we won't see until next quarter. So, you know, should you pile into Datadog now? Well, you know, it's a bit beyond the accumulation zone right now. You can see some slowing on the horizon. It's probably not one to basically remortgage your house on and bet all your money on, but is it a good bet long-term? Chart says yes. Um, again, from the post-COVID lows here, big wave one up, wave two down, trough just between the 61.8, 78.6 retrace. So again, a classical wave two uh, bottom and reversal. It has reversed and we may well be at the bottom of wave three here, in which case there's some strong moves ahead. That's day stock. We've got two more. Um, one, Sentinel One, I'm just going to do on the chart. Sentinel One is a cybersecurity business. Most people haven't heard of it. Uh, it's a competitor to CrowdStrike. Everyone's heard of CrowdStrike. Um, it competes largely on price. CrowdStrike is, you know, market leader now and exploits its market leader status by premium pricing. 
and um, CrowdStrike fundamentals are slowing and worsening. Their rate of revenue growth is slowing, order book is slowing, margins are going down at the same time that growth is going down, which is a concern. Um, so normally in a software company, when growth comes down, margins go up because you have to spend less on sales and marketing, less on product development, um, and you get a, basically a better revenue yield on spend. But with CrowdStrike, growth is coming down and margins going down. That tells you they're spending more and more and more to grow less and less and less. That's not a great fundamental position to be in. One of the major reasons for that is Sentinel-1. Sentinel-1 does many of the same things, um, and endpoint detection, all that stuff, uh, but it's a cheaper play. It probably isn't quite as good a product. Um, you have to ask an engineer, but that probably doesn't matter. It, it, it's got enough large customers to tell you the product's good enough. Sentinel-1, uh, again, we've, it's a recent IPO, so we've charted it from zero level here. Big wave one up, wave two down. The troughs at where? Yep, the 786 uh, retrace of that wave one up. Even though you know there's, it's a notional zero, it's weird how this works. Again, so therefore it's not weird. And we probably are early in a wave three up here. And you know there isn't huge buying here, there isn't huge momentum because it's not a very well known stock. But look at the volume profile on the right here. This is really interesting. This profile here tells you how many stocks, how many shares were traded at its price level. Volume down here tells you how many shares were traded on the you know, per time frame. This tells you per price frame. And look, one of the ways you spot accumulation is look at the volumes in, in the price zone. So the biggest two nodes, as they're called here, are in this price range here. Well, that can't be pre-IPO. It can't be post-IPO. Pre-IPO shares aren't tracked here. They're traded private. They're not tracked here. It can't be post-IPO because the stock wasn't up here. So that tells you that as this thing has bottomed here, somebody is quietly buying quite a lot of shares. So you can say that someone's selling them as well, and of course they are, but someone is quietly buying them. So if you had to guess, you would probably say that fearful retail are probably selling, and you would guess that long-term focused big money is probably buying. And we don't know that, that's a speculation, but you would say that's probably the case because what you don't see all over Fintwit and all over CNBC is people you know, rushing to buy all these beaten up tech stocks at the 78.6 78 retrace. You, you really don't see that. You see people saying that it's all finished for tech still, and you know, this is a bear market rally we're in right now, and blah, blah, blah. So most likely that's institutional accumulation. And if that's happening, well, you know, we want to accumulate too. So again, we've drawn the accumulation zone between 78.6 retrace and the 61.8, nothing particularly scientific about it, but it's a nice set of guardrails, stop loss zone below that. Again, if it gets below the 78.6 at this point, something bad has happened. And um, again, every chance we're early in a way three up here. So again, method here is, you know, be disciplined, and stop buying around here, at least for your long-term position. There's no reason you can't trend, trade momentum up here, but for a long-term position, think about stopping at the top here, stop at the bottom too, because if we get down here, something bad's happening, have the discipline on the downside, have discipline on the upside, just stop here for the long term and just let somebody else price up uh, your holding. And then as we approach a wave three, and again, we'll know when that happens. We'll see the extensions uh, get hit. We'll see buying slow, we'll see it. As we approach that wave three top, consider distributing or you know hold for that shallow wave four and wave five higher. That's Sentinel one. And then the last one we'll talk about is Spire, which is an entirely speculative um, opportunity. So Spire, is a uh, space SPAC stock. So there you go, it's got two reasons to strike out and walk away right now. It, it's a space business and everyone knows that um, space is a terrible place to invest, uh, unless you call Iridium um, or L3 Harris or Maxar uh, or um, Lockheed Martin or Aerojet Rocketdyne or a whole bunch of other companies that are quietly making a ton of money in space, but apparently space is a terrible place to invest. So let's let's go with that. And also, as everyone knows, SPAC stocks are all frauds and shouldn't be touched. So there's two reasons to not invest in SPAC. Except this company has approaching $100 million in run rate revenue, most of which is government contracts, US government contracts. Uh, the business operates its own low cost fleet of uh, radio frequency Earth observation satellites. So those are satellites that don't watch the Earth, they listen to the Earth and they listen for uh, weather changes, they listen for 
shipping signals in that frequency range, and they run at really, really low power and low cost, so they're cheap. The satellites they make are, you know, pizza box size, and they loft, you know, hundreds of them at, at 50, 100 of them at a time. Our merchant providers like SpaceX, they operate the, the constellation and then they sell the data to NASA, the NRO, and other government agencies like that. Um, the stock's trading at around three times trading revenue. Uh, the, the reason it's so beaten up is, you know, one, space backs have all just sold off really hard. Two, no one knows the business. You know, it, it's not called AST Space Mobile, which sounds cool um, if you're 12 and has the you know somewhat dreamlike notion of being able to make study the telephony calls from the ground to space and back again thus avoiding uh, verizon and at&t and so forth um it's not a science project it's not dream weaving it's just a real business that lofts cheap satellites flies them around the earth uh listens to the weather listens to ships listens to a bunch of other stuff sells the data to governments collects the cash and moves on it's a recurring revenue business um the balance sheet's really thin so uh, we put notes on this both in the main service and the newsletter today. You'll see the company has a yeah, thin level of cash. The company is absolutely adamant, whichever way you push them, that it's adequately capitalized. And they'll be right or wrong. I don't know. Um, but they can certainly set out arguments as to why they're right. They, they say that the costs are coming down post the de spacking They don't have double uh, audit fees. They don't have um, a whole bunch of other double fees. So they at least are convinced that they have enough cash and they don't need to raise any more debt or equity. We'll see. But um, three times revenue for a business that no one's heard of that's growing really fast, really quickly. Um, so in the you know high double digits range, so not quite a hundred percent, but not certainly north of fifty percent, uh, it will do this year. Um, which is intent on reaching cash generation within, I think that's a couple of years. Um, that's down in the you know almost penny stock range. So this is not clearly a stock to throw all your money at, but it might be a stock to take a speculative position in with appropriate position size. Um, and yeah, question in the chat room. Yeah, it's on a subscription model. Yes. Um, uh, this might be a, a speculative opportunity that you wish to pursue. Now, again, look at the volume profile, okay? Hardly any shares traded up here. This was the immediate post-back period, uh, pre, sorry, pre-spack period. Uh, there was a huge liquidity squeeze on the warrants, which, uh, fell over into the stock and folks who are members of the full service here uh, one of our members actually not us one of our members called this spotted it and a number of us made very 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 good money with the warrants on the way up here very good money indeed and so the decline in the equity price has been well not ideal but it's already paid for itself with the warrant uh, gains up here and again, I'd like to say it's our work. It wasn't it was one of our subscribers, which is one of the benefits of the full service, which is there's a community aspect to it. And many, many smart people who are members contributing ideas all the time. And so it's all beaten up down here. But look, that's where the traded volume is down here. OK, down here. Hardly any shares traded up here. A few here. A lot down here. So that looks like accumulation to me. Could be wrong. Could just be coincidence, could be, don't know, could be just a lot of churn, could be retail selling in and out, don't know. That looks like accumulation to me. And if that is accumulation, and if the company continues to execute, and if it does in fact have enough money, then this thing can rip from here, you know, really move up. Um, you saw today, you know, nothing businesses, AST Mobile today, hold on a second. Okay, I don't. Here we go. Astra. Okay, this is a launch provider, which can't launch anything because their rockets keep blowing up. 23% up today, out of nowhere, um, because I don't know why. But so these beaten up space back stocks, they can move a lot. So again, not one to bet the farm on, but as a speculative opportunity where you might lose everything, have to factor that in. It's a pretty good opportunity in my view. Okay, that's a slow money idea. So any comments on those? That's Airbnb, Datadog, Sentinel. Spire, we're accumulate rating on all of them. Datadog, I'm assuming a little uh, share drop tomorrow that will take it back into the accumulation zone. Right now, it's slightly above it, but it's right on the cusp there. Any questions about those? I see no questions. Okay. Right, so um, fast money ideas, and these are inherently risky, as we know. 
Now, um, let's again turn to uh, an idea from uh, one of our members today. Someone asking about uh, the SOXL today, which is the levered uh, semiconductor index ETF. Um, I'll just switch this onto a lock screen. Why not? Bear with me one second. Okay. Um, now, this ETF can hurt you badly. But only if you get your position size wrong or you forget to use stop losses uh, or some other grievous mistake. This thing moves up like a rocket and down like a flame out rocket or some better analogy. So it was the best performing ETF uh, post COVID. It moved up from three, three £3.50 up to $74. So that's pretty good in uh, what, less than two years. Uh, it came down pretty hard. So this is a log scale with a fib adjusted to be, uh, let me just check that they are. It has to be a log scale because the movements are so big. Yep, I guess the fib adjusted for logs. Okay, so way one up, way two down, troughs at the 61.8 retrace and has you know moved up again with other risk assets and came down again the last day or two. So this is a play on, it's a long semiconductor play. It's a 3x levered ETF. So if semiconductors move up, this thing will move. And on this log scale, you can see the extent to which it could move up. If this is the start of a wave three up, and it may well be, then minimum target will be 75. So that's, uh, where did it close today? Close around 20 something, we'll look at it. Um, so that's you know three X up from here minimum way three target if, if semi start to move up. Uh, a normal extension, 100% extension that wave one could take you to 220. And then there's just silly extensions beyond uh, involving this guy up here in his Lambo, which we don't even need to talk about. So if semis move up, this thing can rip. Arguments for risk assets are down. Um, if tech is moving up, semis are moving up. You've got this whole push in the US right now to invest in reshoring semiconductor manufacturing. And that one way or the other, I suspect, will benefit the stocks, even though perhaps their costs will go up. Um, but this is mostly US semiconductor stocks in here. So if semis move up, this thing can, can rocket. Against that, if you dig into the holdings, the holdings, you know, levered index, but underneath that, if you look at the actual stocks, Qualcomm, Micron, Intel and so on. Yeah, um, question in the chat room, do we see the fundamental on semis weakening? Yeah, yes. And so this is the argument against, which is if you look at the individual charts, Qualcomm doesn't look such a hot chart. It hasn't corrected enough uh, technically from the highs to feel confident that it's bottomed. Micron showed some weakness this week. Uh, Nvidia warned on their Q2, which they've yet to release. Um, so Nvidia growth slowed really hard, they say due to gaming slowdown, but some data center weakness as well. So on fundamentals, you'd say semi is probably not brilliant timing right now. But against that, well, stocks don't trade on fundamentals. They trade ahead of the news. The fundamentals follow the stock. So the, the, if the SMH, which is the unlevered index um, that traces the Philadelphia SOX index, if that SMH is moving up because semiconductor stock sentiment is moving up because the market expects fundamentals to improve in due course, then SOX can move up fast. So it's the fastest of fast money opportunities, this. If it works, it works brilliantly. Uh, if it doesn't, it can hurt. And so if you follow this sort of idea, you, you have to bring in, you have to bring in risk management. You have to think about um, position size. You have to think about uh, stop losses. The point in the chat room is decay. That's true. So with these levered instruments, they're intended as day trading instruments. Um, and if you look on the uh, ETF provider's website, all over that, it will tell you this. It is a daily ETF. It attempts to replicate three times the daily movement of the SOXX index. That doesn't mean it's designed as a compounding instrument. It's not. You know, the fees compound up. Um, and you can construct all sorts of scenarios whereby the index goes up, but, but you know, weird wobbly crazy up and you're 
uh, levered index, in, your levered ETF goes down. So these are, you know, weapons of financial mass destruction. They're toxic when they go wrong. When they go right, as you can see from the post-COVID move up, they go very right. So that's SOXEL. Uh, we posted this idea in the main service this morning um, and um, also in the newsletter this morning. Again, I'd like to say this is our idea. It wasn't. It came from a, the, the origin of it came from one of our members and we just drew some pictures. Um, that's a high risk idea to consider. Uh, next, let's look at the SQQQs and the Qs. Okay, so this again. There's, these are three times levered uh, ETFs. I'm just going to switch this back to linear. Okay. Because the NASDAQ has basically only ever gone up, then SQQQ, which is a three times levered um, inverse NASDAQ fund, long term is a dreadful investment. You know, as you can see, it's gone up a bit recently because the NASDAQ's down a bit recently, but long term is a dreadful investment. Short term, it can be pretty useful. So when the market's going down, SQQQ is a great thing to own because it goes up pretty quickly. And um, it trades, I personally don't find these things trade brilliantly to FIBS, although I haven't tried it on log scale, which um, somebody pointed out this week. But they do trade quite well to just normal trading channels. And so, um, yeah, point in chat room, apply chart analysis on the underlying. Yeah, you can do that. You can trade the levered ETFs by looking at the charts of the underlying index. Yeah, sure. And if the underlying index is going up, the levered ETF is going up more. Again, subject to that fee decay and compound decay point I mentioned earlier. So th these are these are not easy instruments, but you know, if you want fast money, you have to take some risk. So that's why we picked these levered instruments here. SQQQ here, it's on the bottom of this trading channel up. So if the market, uh, it keeps going up, this thing's going to keep going down. And so this is going to be a dreadful long to hold if if, um, if the queues keep moving up. If we get some short-term weakness in the queues, which as we looked at the QQQ chart, looks like we might, then you'll get a little bump here. Um, for it to move up to these recent highs, you, you need a collapse in the market, which of course might happen, but you know, how few is it probably won't. So uh, the opportunity here is probably just to take small bite sizes and use it either as a hedge uh, against, if you long use it as a hedge uh, to protect your uh, account, um, or just take small short, small bite sizes to profit on the short side. Uh, these inverse ETFs are quite useful if you don't like to short or you have an account that doesn't permit you to short. That's SQQ. Uh, let's look at TQQQ, which is the opposite. Now we had a really, really good call on this in the service uh, the last month or so. So the call was um, based on this chart. And um, we said, well, think about buying TQQQ at 26, not lower, because we wanted to see it climb up and over that 786 retrace, because below that could keep going down. So we said buy at 26. And we said consider selling around um, 30. Five, and we said 35 because that was the top of that. Uh, that would be, yeah, June peak there. And it worked really, really well. So it was free money from 26 to 35, $9 a share off of the 26 uh, base. So that's what, it's about a 35% return. It happened about four weeks. That's nice when it happens, it doesn't happen very often. If TQQ falls back, so we get some weakness in the market, there's no reason why you can't repeat that trick. So if, in fact, the queues are in a move up, if we are in a uh, fifth wave up now in the queues, then you'll see this move up quickly. And so the way to play these levered index ETFs is, we said on the, the first slide, read the room. You have to watch the market. You have to smell the market. You have to see which way it's going. And um, again, be careful. Protect yourself with permission, position sizing. Protect yourself with stop losses or trading losses, or trading stops, or whatever you want to use. Um, but you know, going naked exposure on these things probably isn't the wisest thing in the world. So that's TQQ. Is it, is it a great buy today? Well, it might be, but you know, best guess we get some. Uh, 
weakness, and then another move up, best guess. So this is one just to keep an eye on. And the funny thing is with TQ View, it moves so quickly that even if you don't time the bottom perfectly, you can make good money. Um, if you see the queues, if you watch the futures overnight, if you watch the queues um, early in the day, if they're starting to move and they look like they can keep moving, you can be in and out of TQQQ in a day and make pretty good money. So there's three fast money ones to watch. Soxwell, SQQQ, which is 3X inverse short NASDAQ, and TQQ, which is 3X uh, levered long NASDAQ. And those are your fast money ideas. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, God, can you mitigate decay? Yeah, probably, but I don't know how to do that. That's too hard, if you ask me. Cleverer people than me can probably do that, yeah. Um, okay, let's talk briefly about sector rotation. It's a huge topic, um, and we've been doing a lot of work on this in the main service. Um, so let's just talk through what this is. This goes back to the Wickoff cycle work that we're trying to do. So this whole accumulate, markup, distribute, markdown cycle. And what we're trying to do with sector rotation is say, look, how big money treats sectors isn't that it suddenly decides that you know oil is the hot new thing. It doesn't suddenly decide that you know now it's going to be lumber, now it's going to be tech. What it does is it has enough money that it can move these things around. So there's absolutely no rhyme or reason as to why through 2022 year to date sectors other than energy are basically down. You know, what you normally expect is a rotation from growth to value and back again. And so, you know, if you've gone into 2022, um, having either sold out of your growth stuff or, or hedged your growth stuff with some value buys, if you bought defense, telecom, all that stuff, that, that was a reasonable thing to do at the back end of last year. If you just kept all your growth stuff and did nothing, well, you know, that was a lot of risk you took on, that probably didn't work out so well. But if you sold down some growth and hedged with some value, that was probably a sensible thing to do. Turned out to be a dumb move. Uh, the only good move in 2022 so far has been to be very long energy. And that, I think, was accelerated by the Russia-Ukraine uh, invasion, but it wasn't created by it. It was created by big money sector rotation. So what we're trying to do here is go, OK, well, let's, let's use the spider uh, sector ETFs to look at, can we track? where money is coming in and out. I mean, can we just try and tag along with that? We're not going to be ahead of it, we don't know, but if we can tag along with it just a little bit behind, can we make some money uh, from these sectors? Again, using the ETFs, not trying to guess individual stocks, but just using the ETFs. And we've done that quite well so far in the main service. So we've had success with being short energy uh, around this time. We've had success with being short oil, uh, short wheat, short corn. Uh, those work quite well. And at the moment, we're trying to play on the long side where we've been buying uh, beaten up uh, sectors, specifically consumer discretionary and um, communication services, which is Netflix and that sort, of, that sort of thing. Now, how we did this, let's look at the sector rotation. So these lines are just you know, different spider ETFs or sector ETFs. So year to date, 2022 year to date, the, the only ones up are energy and utilities. That's it. Even now, after the big moves up in the market in the last month or so, even now, Everything else is down, quite hard down, actually, surprising. Okay, last three months, what started to happen? Okay, in the last three months, look, money's rotated. Money's come out of energy, <clears throat> and it's gone into consumer discretionary. It's gone into tech. It's gone into real estate. It's gone into utilities. It's gone into industrials. Now, this is a bit weird if you think about it, because... If, in fact, stocks follow the news, well, this wouldn't happen, would it? Because inflation's up, crazy up, 8.5% year on year, we just saw it. Rates are up. No, rates are still low historically, but they're going up, and the rate, rates are shocking in the market. Everyone's squealing about their gas bills and their food bills, and it doesn't matter how much money you've got, you know, your gas costs a hell of a lot more now than it did six months ago. And uh, for most people, that means they're buying less discretionary stuff. And therefore, consumer discretionary should be down if stocks follow the news, right? Because people are going to buy less iPhones, Apple stock's going to go down, and therefore you don't want to be long to keep consumer discretionary, do you? Well, as you can see, that's absolutely not true at all, because what's happening is big money is leading the news. Big money's going, well, consumer discretionary is all beaten up now, because look, year to date, consumer discretionary is on the floor. 
19% down year to date. So what a great time to buy because big money isn't scared about buying down here. And the reason they're not scared about buying down here is because they move enough money to move it up. It's not scary for them. So three months in, right, with inflation raging, uh, with rates going up, with uh, discretionary purchases, everyone saying they can't afford it, with you know loan defaults rising, with all those buy now, pay later schemes getting into trouble, with you know default risks rising, consumer discretionary is up, 10% up last three months. Um, tech up last three months, and um, what's not up, com services. Okay, flat, last three months. So what we said about, I can't forget, but a couple of months ago in the service was, well, maybe it's, start, start to, it's time to start accumulating some of these beaten up ones. Com services, you know, Netflix been destroyed, as you know, and consumer discretionary. Maybe it's time to be buying those. And so far, um, we're up about six and a half points on both in the last month or so. Now, that's not exciting, that's not TQQ, but this isn't supposed to be a fast money idea, it's supposed to be a big money idea, therefore take it slow. Let's look at what's happened in the last month. Well, a lot of things are up in the last month, but look at what's up the most, consumer discretionary, right? Not an accident. Com services, still not really moved, it's only 3% up, but just today, or well, yesterday, I should say, Disney reported blowout streaming numbers, absolutely blowout numbers. And they're well on track to beat all their expectations. Disney stocks up, and it's up because of streaming. Streaming still losing a boatload of money for Disney. Netflix is still going to move to ads, you know, all that. Um, but streaming didn't die. You know, Netflix just hit a speed bump, which it does every now and then. So consumer, dis consumer discretionary, we just moved to hold on in the main service today because uh, it's above. I'm just going to call up the chart here. Hold on. Yeah, it, this is XLY consumer discretionary. We reached above our accumulate zone, so we moved to hold. Time just to sit back now and let somebody else price it up for us. Com services, though, XLC. That's still an accumulate zone. We haven't quite top where we're going to finish accumulating yet, but it will be somewhere between the 61.8 and 382 retrace. Uh, if we just put in a 0.5 retrace into here, yeah, we can call that the accumulation zone. So between you know this low here, call it 52.53. And up to about 63, that'll be an accumulation zone. Beyond that, do nothing, let somebody else mark it up. And below that, put a stop. So XLC is still an accumulate option for us. Now this you know, will work or it won't, but, but I suspect it will. And it comes from this sector rotation model. And this is the last five days. Now, interestingly, look here, energy back up. Okay, so what that tells you in the last five days, Big money was anticipating a drop in the market, and hence money has flowed back into energy. Uh, it's flowed back into, what's that healthcare, I think, fin financials, back into materials. So this is the last five days. So these things, again, are good canaries in the coal mine. You can read just a little bit into the future with these things, because if money's going into energy stocks, it probably isn't going into growth. And if it's not going into growth, it's probably not pushing the, the queues uh, and the spies up. So you could say that's a little bit maybe of evidence that the recent rallies in the queues and the spies was maybe some short covering, some put covering, that sort of thing, rather than new money going in, because new money looks like it's going into energy. Now, this this fund here, XLE, it's heavily dominated by two two companies, uh, ExxonMobil and Chevron. So there are other uh, probably more representative indicators of, of energy, but um, but that that's a that was a good indicator that the market was going to come off a little bit. Uh, okay, um, point in the chat room, sector ETFs, if rates fall, bullish for building services. Yeah, good one. Which is, what's building services? Do you know the ticker, Jay? The XLB or something. 
materials. No, sorry, sorry, I've just asked Joe for the ticket for building services, just typing it out. ITB, so actually XHB is a spider. Okay, hold on. Let's take a look at this. Yeah, well, that was like reversal to me. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at that. Well, that told you in June <laughs> that inflation was going to come down and rates were going to stop going up quite as fast. Again, these things are always ahead of the news. What's that? 50% retrace. A bit below. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, you're late on builders. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> okay, interesting. I was shame you didn't see that. That, that. that would have been a really good canary in the coal mine. Okay, these things are really interesting. Always run ahead of the news. You can always see ahead of the news just a few days or a few weeks of these things. Okay, so you see the value of sector rotation. That's what we're doing. We're not perfect at it. We'll get some things wrong, but this is a, a long run focus for us. We're going to be doing this for years and getting better at, better at it. Okay, um, we run over time a little bit. Any more questions from anybody about anything we cover in the webinar, any market stuff, any stocks we cover, stocks we don't cover, um, anything at all? Do speak up. Okay, no one has any points or questions. Okay, well, I hope everyone thought that was, I got one question coming in the chat room, hold on. Wait with bated breath. GLBE. Is that a US stock? I, I don't know it. Um, so I, I, I saw your request earlier. Um, I don't know the company. If it's a US headquartered business and a US uh, primary listed stock, we can take a look, but it's going to have to wait. Lots of questions coming in the chat room. Hold on. Israeli. We don't cover them. Right? We're purely, purely US uh, focused. So I don't know, it looked pretty interesting. There's some pretty good articles I thought on Seeking Alpha. I took a quick look at it when you mentioned it earlier, but we, we don't cover any non-US stocks at all, just to keep it simple. All right, okay. So let's call it a day. Thanks everyone for attending. Hope it was uh, interesting and or useful uh, and or a way to avoid doing any work. And um, thanks everyone for being members of our various services. If you're a newsletter member, do consider stepping up to join the main service. It's, it's a good one, people like it. Uh, we're growing really nicely in an environment where most folks aren't. And um, you're welcome to join us anytime. Thanks everyone, and we'll see you again on Sunday.